God, we praise you because you are a holy God. You are a missionary God, a God that transforms lives, just like you transformed Jill's life, you transformed my life. God, I pray that this service would not be just another service, God. I pray that you would just speak to our hearts. God, I, I just praise you because you care about the peoples of all the nations. You care about the people around us. And you want to use us as your instruments of peace. You want to use us as your ambassadors. God, use us. Speak to our hearts now. Open us up for your service. May our hands be open for service, God. God, we're tired of playing games. We don't want to play games anymore, God. We want to be fully used by you. I pray for each person in this service right now. I pray that you would speak to their heart, God, and you would open their mind to your word on their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as followers of Christ, God's message to us is that we are to be totally his, heart, hands, and voice. Part of being totally his is stepping out of our comfort zone. There's a great quote by Ed Savoso. It says, if you want to see what you've never seen, you have to do what you've never done. I remember when I was in Peru as a single missionary, and I was there, and I went over to a missionary house. We had lunch many times there, and I went over, and there was a big pot of food cooking on the stove. And so I helped myself. I put a lot of rice in the, in the bowl there, and I just put a big helping of the food. And uh, usually we ate together, but that day, everybody just kind of went their own way. And I uh, was sitting down, and I was eating my food, and uh, I, I was thinking, this doesn't taste right. Something's not right here. And so I kind of prayed the missionary prayer. I don't know if you've heard the missionary prayer. God, I, I got it down. Lord, please keep it down. So I was praying the missionary prayer there. And, and so one of the helpers came, and, and she said, Chris, well, what are you eating? And I, I said, well, the food, it was in the big pot boiling, and it smelled so good. And she said, Chris, that's not for us. That was the dog food. <laughs> and so in Peru, what they do is they get all the fatty stuff, all the stuff that you don't want to eat, and they put it in a big pot, and they boil it, and they give it to the dogs. And I ate the dog food. <laughs> I was out of my comfort zone. God is calling us to be out of our comfort zone. He's also telling us that we are not our own. We were bought with a price. We no longer belong to ourselves. We must be totally his. I invite you to open your Bibles to Matthew 22, verses 34 through 39, which is the greatest commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commands. This passage is a third part of three questions asked of Jesus by religious leaders in Jerusalem. The first question is designed as a trap. It's about paying taxes to Caesar. The third is a test. Jesus' response leaves the leaders amazed and silent, at the same time winning over the listening crowd in the temple courtyard. The religious leaders, they weren't seeking spiritually. They wanted to show Jesus up. The Pharisees asked the first question, then the Sadducees take a turn with the second question about marriage at the resurrection. And lastly, the Pharisees again. We can see the rivalry between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. One party failed to put Jesus on the spot, so the other party is going to try out. The crowd is on Jesus' side. And it was amazing how the Pharisees tried to even set up a stronger trap for Jesus. 
It's a trap because there's 613 commandments in the Torah, the first five books of Moses. Picking one over the other risks saying that one is more important, which might displease some religious leaders and not others. But what Jesus does is he elevates love as the primary principle over everything, which is difficult to object to. It's significant how Jesus brings two texts together, to love God and to love others. See, he goes beyond the scope of the original question to incorporate a second commandment that must go with the first. We're to love God, but we also have to love others. If we're only loving God, we're having a self-centered spiritual experience. Both are essential. These two summarize not only the law, but the prophets as well. Summarizing the whole Old Testament, all of the Old Testament commandments find their place in the working out and the practical applications of loving God and loving others. Jesus goes back to the Old Testament. He picks a familiar passage that the Jews knew about. It was Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, and with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, and when you walk along the road, and when you lie down, and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands, and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses, and on your gates. Israel during this time, was a liberated slave people in the plains of Moab. They were ready to enter the promised land. They were receiving opposition from every side. They fought the Edomites, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Canaanites, the Amorites. They lived a nomadic lifestyle. And they had threats from every angle and everywhere they looked in the land flowing with milk and honey the land of Canaan. The purpose of this book to, was for Moses to address a number of concerns before going into the land of Canaan. He wanted to make sure that the people understood who they were, where they came from, and what God had wanted for them in the future. Deuteronomy reiterates the covenant in terms appropriate to a new generation Moses was about to die, so he wanted to write down God's revelation for Israel. It would serve as a source of law and practice for Israel as they enter into the promised land. This passage in Deuteronomy was very familiar to the Jews. It's known as the Shema, Hebrew, for hear, which was a Jewish confession of faith, and the pious Jews recited it twice, daily, the passage was so important to the Jews that they would put it in small leather boxes like you see on the screen and on their doorpost, on their left arm, and on their forehead. So Jesus takes a familiar passage and then he adds another passage that was familiar to them, but he puts the two together. And he says, you're not just to love God, but you're to love your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus 19.18 says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So what does it mean to be totally his? We must show the world how we are God's heart, God's hands, and God's voice. We are God's heart. We have to have a burden for the lost. We have to care. There's a problem in American Christianity today. There's a plague in our churches, and that plague is apathy. We just don't care. If it doesn't personally affect us, we don't care. Maybe we don't say that, but our actions reflect that. What would happen if we see the world the way God sees the world? We have to have a heart for the nations. That means we're involved in what God is doing around the world. As we learn about missions in other countries, 
We pray, we give, and we go. We have to have a heart for reaching internationals in the United States. I've heard it said in the United States today, you're either going to be bilingual and bicultural or by yourself. And I think that's true. The world is changing around us. The nations are coming to us, and we have an opportunity to bring the gospel to them. Just in the greater Houston area, there is so many unreached. There are Muslims, there are Buddhists, there are Hindus. We have to reach these people with the gospel. We have to reach the Muslims. There are as many as 200,000 Muslims and 72 mosques and schools in the greater Houston area alone. We have to reach Buddhists. There are 140,000 Buddhists in the greater Houston area and 22 Buddhist temples. Kwan Am, a Buddhist goddess, has her largest statue in Houston, 72 foot tall, which is about the same height as Sam Houston. We have to reach Hindus. There's many as 100,000 Indians in Houston. 80% are Hindu and the rest or Muslim. There are 10 Hindu temples, including a massive temple in Sugar Land that's 73 foot tall. About 3,000 craftsmen across India came and carved the temple out of Turkish limestone and Italian marble. You can see a picture there on the screen. We have a special call to take the gospel to the unreached. The unreached around us and then the many unreached around the world. We are also God's hands. There's enough casual Christianity in our churches today. We live in an age where it's a norm to be a casual Christian. God has called us to be more than just casual Christians. Of the seven people, seven billion people in the world, 40% live on two dollars or less a day. Americans We make up 5% of the world's population, but we consume 50% of the world's resources. More than 2 billion children live in our world. Half live in poverty. One of every four children in the world has to work instead of go to school. These statistics should bother us. They should move us to action. We have to make a difference in the poor and our community and the poor that are around the world. We should be involved in making a difference in their lives. We come to church to worship God. You've all come here on Sunday to worship God. But what would happen if our worship was our hands active in service? What's your view of of church membership. What is our view of church membership? There's a great book called I Am a Church Member by Tom Rainer, and it talks about having a country club church membership mentality. Well, what does that mean? What does it mean to have a country club church membership mentality? Well, as a country club member, membership means perks. It means privileges. It means others serve me. Just pay the going rate, And you can have others take care of you while you enjoy a life of leisure. Membership is about receiving instead of giving. It's about being served instead of serving. It's about rights instead of responsibilities. Entitlements instead of sacrifices. God is calling us to do so much more. He's calling us to be the body of Christ. He's calling us to be so much more, not only amongst ourselves, but in the community. He's calling us to be the church and to help the hurting and to be there when people are going through difficult times. Biblical church membership means that we are all necessary parts of the whole. We are different but we still work together. Everything we say and do is based on the biblical foundation of love. Church membership is a gift from God that we should treasure with great joy and anticipation. I want to ask you a question. Do you know how to remain a biblical member of the church? There's an easy way to do it. 
Give abundantly and serve without hesitation. When we turn our minds and our hearts more to service instead of entitlement, then we see the glory of God flowing through us because we're serving others and we're loving others in a practical way. We are God's voice. You know, evangelism, it's become almost a bad word now because you hear the word and you feel bad because you're not doing it and you feel guilty. Uh, well, it's evangelism, it's a lot like asking a girl out for the first time. I remember when I met Kathy, we were at the Missionary Learning Center, and after about three days, uh, we had gotten to know each other briefly, and we were walking back to the quad where she was staying, and I turned to her and I said, Kathy, uh, do you like me? And she, <laughs> it was very bold of me, and uh, fortunately it worked out, obviously, but she, her answer is the best. So uh, she turns to me and gives me a female answer and says, definitely, maybe. <laughs> I had no idea what to do with that. That was my first introduction to how women are complex and great and beautiful and uh, all of those things wrapped in together and that's what started our journey together as um, later as a couple and then as husband and wife. Well, we have to go beyond those feelings of anxiousness. I was nervous about asking her that question. <laughs> Do you like me? Because she could say, no. Loser, what? <laughs> she could say a whole bunch of different things. But she, thankfully, she didn't. And we have to get beyond those feelings and share the gospel with love. How we communicate the gospel is just as important as the words that we say. Many times we, we think we're communicating, but the other person doesn't hear anything. You know, a non-Christian can hear our religious talk as, as static. It's kind of like Charlie Brown's parents. We really never know what they're saying, right? All we know, all we hear is, wah, 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 wah. Well, how we communicate the gospel is extremely important. We can't just use our religious rhetoric and and expect an unbeliever to understand it and to receive it. We have to know how to communicate in a way that they can understand and receive it. How do we view evangelism? You know, there's different ways that we can look at evangelism. Some say that evangelism is like conquest, like the old hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. Instead, I think we should view evangelism as a dance where we are listening we don't compromise the gospel message, but there's give and take in the conversation, just like in a dance where one moves one place, the other moves another place, and it's a beautiful um, example of how we don't come across as arrogant or know-it-alls, but we're as a learner, as a fellow traveler. We present our words with humility. Lifeway did a survey in 2011 of almost 3,000 Protestant church members in the United States, 80% agree that they have a personal responsibility to share Christ with others. 61 have not shared Christ with anyone in the last six months. 48% have not invited anyone to church in the past six months. It said that 20% of Christians rarely pray for non-believers. My goal in sharing this with you is not to make you feel bad, but to bring to light the situation of where we are as a church and change. We have to change because it is a lost and dying world and we are to be the hands and feet of Christ. God wants us to be his ambassadors of love and light to others. These numbers should bother us. They should prompt us to action. I want to share a little bit about this last year. It's been an incredible year. 2013 has been a year of harvest. I've seen more people come to Christ this year than I have my entire life combined. I've felt a burden constantly 
for the many who don't know Christ and how I need to share the love of Christ with them. And even as it's been a harvest year, it's also been the most difficult year in my life and our family's life, personally, as Kathy has been struggling with cancer. God has put us in a place where we have to totally trust him. We have to put all of our faith in him. He's helped us to see as we live out, this is what it means to be a faithful servant of God. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know the future. But you do know that I am a God that cares about you. I am a God that is with you. I am a God that have my arms open wide and I'm embracing you and I'm sending you out to be ambassadors of peace to the nations. In the family mission trip, we did VBS and clothing distribution, a concert in the park. We saw 29 people come to Christ. The clothing distribution at Higher Expectations Church for the community and battered women, we saw 42 people come to Christ. Blessings in a backpack, same place, 25 decisions. We helped start financially and uh, we're also helping Alpha Crisis Pregnancy Center. We've been helping local mission centers as well and packing and helping on distribution days. Just yesterday, I was at the Christmas uh, store in the mission centers of Houston, and some of you were with me. The Northeast Mission, we've been there and we saw 14 of the kids come to Christ through our camp and then our follow up classes that we did with them. The Peru Mission Trip, 61 people coming to Christ and the Peru Mission Trip. In the prison ministry, we saw 48 people come to faith. We're going again next Sunday. We'd love to have all of you with us. We'll find a spot for you. We're looking for guys to facilitate the small group time, and we're going to share the gospel with 180 prisoners, and many are going to come to faith. If you want to see the glory of God, then come with us, because it's going to be an amazing time of God's working in the lives of those young men. On On the Turkey mission trip, we saw one person come to Christ. That one person is so significant in a land that is dry spiritually, unreached. And in eastern Turkey, we saw a man come to Christ on our mission trip. In Senegal, a Muslim country, we saw 30 souls saved. Just last month, my my friend, Stephen Erickson, He came to Christ. He used to be Caleb's soccer coach. We've been praying for this family for years. These lives transformed by Christ are only a sample of the many who've been reached with the gospel this year. Let's watch a video about being totally his. God wants us to be active. You awake daily, unaware of the miracle of you. Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, three elements, those found in dust, together form cells, muscles, bones, and blood. United in an effort to make you, you. Made of approximately seven octillion atoms, your body houses what cannot be counted or measured. You are more than atoms. You're a soul, a mind, a spirit. You live, build friendships, make music, learn, judge beauty, make a decision, cry. Yet you, understanding that you have been bought with a price and no longer belong to yourself, you wonder what it means to be totally his. All of you, led by God's spirit, obey the greatest of all God's laws, love. Love God and love others with all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. What if you, because of God's love and his spirit in you, all your mind's ability to create and conceive, imagined a new world, a world as envisioned by the mind of God. 
and gave yourself to showing the world that vision. While others seek comfort, you desire more. With all your nerve impulses alerting you to hot, cold, rough and smooth, a calming silence or the chaotic surge of morning traffic, you find contentment in knowing you are his. While others seek security, you with all 60,000 miles of blood vessels, enough to wrap around the world two and a half times, wrap your arms around the unloved. You give up the safety of home or financial security in exchange for loving the marginalized and the broken, that they might know the salvation of which Jesus spoke, while others belonging only to themselves pursue rest. You, knowing all your strength is from Him, clench your muscles with divine determination to finish the race He has set before you. Instead, you apply yourself to one of the 6,000 languages spoken on earth. You apply your curiosity to advancing the gospel so that the message of God's Son is made known to every language and every people. What if you are not the only one who leaves behind self-preoccupation? Imagine your local church occupying itself with being fully God's too. While you begin to collectively understand that you are not your own, you find that your souls, your minds, and your strength work in unity. All of you in rhythm with His Holy Spirit, souls enjoying, minds imagining, strength surging, all of us. The entire church, totally his. What would happen if we were totally his? Instead of a meaningless pursuit of the American dream, we pursued God with reckless abandon. I want to invite you to be totally his. Well, how do we do that? We have to be disciples, making reproducible disciples. We have to have a vision to multiply to see a multiplying effect. In this next slide, we see the difference of one person a day coming to Christ and one person a year being discipled. After 16 years, about 65,000 people will come to Christ through making reproducible disciples. That's in contrast to only 6,000 coming to Christ only through evangelizing. We have to share the gospel with people and then they in turn share the gospel with other people and they in turn share the gospel with other people and we make disciples. We invest in them and they invest in others and we don't count it as victory until we get to fourth and fifth generations. You know, addition is okay. Sharing the gospel with one person here and one person there but multiplication is much better when we can reach so many people with the gospel through investing our lives into the lives of others. Well, what can you do? What can you do to be involved in missions? You can be involved locally and internationally. You can pray and give and go. You know, the Great Commission It's for everybody, not just for pastors, not just for missionaries. We're all called. The Great Commission, it is a mandate for us all, but it's a privilege as well. God chose us and he's chosen you to make a difference in the world. Let's stop being casual Christians and let's be a church that makes an impact on the community. When people say Woodridge Baptist Church, they think about that is a church that cares. That is a church that loves people. I wanna invite you to be sensitive in how God is, is leading you this morning. I wanna invite you to, to do something with this service on the missions kiosk and as you leave, there's a little field guide, it's called Totally His. It's real small, stick in your pocket. You can journal through what God's been talking to you today. 
some other things on the missions kiosk and the, the bulletin flap like the pastor had already said. There's opportunities to you to plug in locally and internationally. Drop that in the offering pray, plate or, or give it to us and we'll get you plugged in to ministry. I wanna open this invitation time up to all of you, maybe those who have never made a decision for Christ. You're probably maybe sitting there and saying, you're talking about missions, and, but I've never made that first decision to invite Christ into my life. You can do that today. There'll be a pastor up front. You can come and talk to that person. Just like Jill Hudgens came to Christ as an adult, you can make that decision today if you've never done that. Maybe you want to be a, a member of this church. This is a great body and we'd love to have you. You can come and talk to a minister about that as well. But the third group of people, I wanna have a special invitation time for those who will be active, who will commit to missions in 2014. That might be going on a mission trip, might be plugging in at a local missions opportunity. I want you to just come at the altar and pray. I wanna pray for you. I'm gonna send you out. We as a church wanna send you out. So you come and you just come to the altar you might be interested. You don't even know where you're going to go. Come and talk to me and we can talk about different options. So everyone who would be active in missions in this next year, we want you to come to the altar and pray. We want to pray for you. As the band sings, break me for the nations, you come and respond as God leads. <laughs>